The following weekend, I came to this church for the first time in my life. I'd never been here. I was introduced to the pastor, and I was seated right over here, where I was seated just now. And when I sat here, I couldn't believe that I was looking at the same pulpit that God showed me in a vision before I ever arrived. I had chills, I had tears, I couldn't believe it, but it says something so strong. Not only was God speaking to me and showing me what he wants me to do, he's showing you that his hand is here in your church. He's holding your church. He revealed your church to me before I arrived. God is working strong. The Holy Spirit is working strong through your church. Praise God. So, when we're in school, we work hard, we study, and we take tests, and then we earn our grades. We're graded on our work or our performance. When we're at our jobs, we come to work, we put in a day's worth of work, and we receive a wage. We get paid for our service, for our works. We're used to working in order to achieve things. We're used to working and doing things in order to be compensated or to be rewarded. It's the culture and the world we live in. When it's our birthday or it's a Christmas or it's a holiday and someone gives us a gift, we understand it's a free gift. We understand we, we didn't work to earn the gift. We don't say, how much do I owe you for that? We don't say, what do I now have to do to deserve that? We understand that this is a, a, a gift that's being given to us. Yet, when it comes to God's gift, his free gift of salvation amen. to all of us, amen, amen, amen. many of us on some level still mistakenly think and still mistakenly believe that we have to work to earn it, that we have to do things and be good enough to earn the free gift of salvation. Because we're so accustomed to working for things in order to have them. We think we have to work to earn everything. Recently, a few weeks ago, we hit a significant day in the history of the church calendar. A significant day in the church history. Recently, last month, was the 500th anniversary, 500 years since the beginning of what's known as the Reformation, or the Protestant Reformation. And to just take you back in history, going back, way back in history, after Jesus ascended to heaven, and that gospel by the Holy Spirit spread, and the church grew and developed, the Roman Empire still remained a pagan land and a pagan nation and they worshiped false gods and goddesses and they engaged in all sorts of ungodly behavior and for 300 years Roman Emperor after Roman Emperor literally tortured and killed anyone following the Lord Jesus Christ but at some point in history an Emperor Constantine decided to embrace this Christian way, realizing we can't stop this. He embraced Christianity, and what developed from that was the Roman Catholic Church. And many felt that what he did was take some of the pagan teachings and beliefs and blend them into, combine them with Bible-based Christianity, and from that developed the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Empire, really was a dominating force. But many, many believers, many Bible 
believers felt that although this church recognized Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they felt that there were many teachings that were unbiblical or that were man-made and that were not found in Scripture or that were contradicted by the Scripture. For example, the teaching was that the church tradition had equal authority to the Word of God and that whatever the Pope said was of equal authority to God's Word. Many believers didn't accept that. They didn't think anything that man or tradition would say is equal authority to God's Word. They taught that we should pray to saints and to Mary. But the believers felt, no, we pray to God through Jesus Christ only. They taught of a place called purgatory where the dead would go for indefinite periods of time for continued suffering and purging of sin. But the believers said, no, Jesus paid it all. It was finished on the cross. And there were always pockets of resistance. There were other teachings, too, that they were in disagreement with. But there were always pockets of resistance to what the Roman Catholic system was teaching. But unfortunately, this was a dark time in history. And those believers in Jesus Christ who resisted what the Roman Catholic Church was teaching were tortured or killed tortured or killed unless they went the way of the system being taught in Rome. But it was 500 years ago last month when a Catholic monk by the name of Martin Luther, who also felt that he didn't like what his own church was teaching and he had objection to what they were teaching, these teachings and others, that he wrote what's commonly known as his 95 Theses, which is 95 questions, areas of concern. And he brought them to the church in Wittenberg, Germany. He wasn't looking to divide the church. He wasn't looking to start new denominations. And today, we should not be divisive. We should and we must love our Catholic brothers and sisters who are, who are seeking Christ. There's no division here. There's no talk of animosity or divide. Satan wants to divide the church. And Martin Luther and the other reformers didn't want to divide. They wanted to reform. They wanted the church to stay true to the biblical teachings in God's word. But unfortunately, Rome wanted nothing to do with that. And those reformers were violently opposed and violently shut down. But it, around, it was around this time in history when the printing press was developed and God's word spread out. And unlike the past where the Church of Rome was able to violently shut down the protesters, now they couldn't, and from that came what's known as the Protestant Reformation. Notice, in, in the word Protestant, we have the word protest. It was a protest to the teachings of Rome. And one of the main issues that they were in disagreement on was how are we saved? How do we go to heaven? How do we get to heaven? What is salvation? The Roman system was teaching that we are saved by our faith in Jesus Christ plus our good works and our good deeds. So there was a works-based teaching for salvation. In other words, they were teaching that faith in Christ alone wasn't enough. You had to do good works and good deeds. That salvation was earned partially by mankind's own effort. But the reformers said, no, Jesus paid it all. We can't earn our salvation. We can't work for our salvation. And there are many verses and passages of scripture which support the teaching that we are saved by grace through faith alone. But the one I want to look at here today is found in Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. 
Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Let me read it to you. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This verse, along with many others, make it clear that we are saved by God's grace through our faith, not our works, not our deeds, so that no one can boast. Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Let's say it together. I'm going to say it, and I'd like you to repeat it, okay? Grace alone. Grace alone. Through faith alone. Through faith alone. In Christ alone. In Christ alone. Amen. In fact, our righteous works, our deeds, God says through Isaiah, are like filthy rags in comparison to a holy, 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 righteous God. All of our wonderful acts of kindness and good deeds and loving acts in comparison to how holy and righteous God is are literally, according to God's own word, filthy rags. We can't earn it. Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So let's talk about what it means, for it is by grace you have been saved. What does saved refer to? Saved refers to our salvation. It's defined as salvation or being saved is defined as the act of being delivered or being redeemed or being rescued. It's deliverance from danger or suffering. We are saved, we receive salvation, we are saved from God's wrath, of, from judgment of sin. Because we know that our sin separates us from God. We know that no matter how big or small the sin is, it separates us from our Lord. And the consequences of our sin are death. Physical death and spiritual death. Amen. When Adam and Eve were created, they were created to be eternal, to live in a garden of Eden for eternity as eternal beings. But the wages of sin are death. And it's from the sin came physical death and spiritual death. Only God can remove our sin. We are helpless on our own. There's nothing you and I can do to take away our own sin. Nothing. Only God can do it. Only He can deliver us from the penalty of sin. Biblical salvation refers to our deliverance, our redemption from the consequences of sin and the removal of sin. It refers to you and I being declared righteous in the eyes of God. You are declared righteous when he sees you because of what Jesus did on the cross. He sees you as righteous. You know why he sees you as righteous? Because he sees Christ in you. Amen. He doesn't see you and me like you and I see you and me. We see all of our brokenness and flaws. Of course he knows that too. He sees Christ in you. Because an amazing thing happened when Jesus laid his life down on that cross. He took on the wrath of sin of all mankind. When you placed your faith in him, he took away. He removed your sin and in exchange... He gave you his righteousness. Only God can do it. This is what salvation refers to. He rescues us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we receive this as a free gift. We could never, ever earn it. Salvation is not an achievement or a reward was something we earn. That's impossible. It's a free gift from God. Amen. Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Amen. Let's talk about grace. 
What does grace refer to? Grace is being given something that you don't deserve. It's undeserved favor or undeserved merit. It's someone giving you something that you didn't earn and you do not deserve it. Let me give you an example of what's not grace, okay? Let's take a young man who works hard at, at his job and he wants to save money to, to get a car. He wants to save money to get a car. And his dad sees that he's working hard and he's doing different jobs and he's putting away what he can and he's doing his best and he gets the, you know, it's time to get the car but he falls short, he doesn't have enough for the car. So his dad, sees, seeing how hard he worked, gives him the rest of the money and is able to get him that car. That's not grace. Because his, he worked and his dad saw how hard he worked and then gave him the money for the car. Grace would be, using this analogy, the young man who didn't work, who squandered what he had, who didn't do anything, who was in sort of rebellion, but his father wanted to show him grace, having nothing to do with his works, and got him that car. That's grace. Grace is a free gift. God's grace is expressed to you and me through Christ, by the forgiveness of our sins, being blessed with the peace and the fulfillment that he gives us to have fellowship with him in this life an eternal fellowship. What the pastor said is so amazing. We are going to be together, all of us, in eternity, forever. It's never gonna end, ever, ever. Your soul and your spirit will leave your body and thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ and thanks for the grace of God and the faith he blessed you with, you're going to enter into his presence. We're going to be together forever and ever and ever. Never lose sight of this. This isn't just wishful thinking. This isn't, I hope that happens. This is God's promise to us. Jesus paid it all. It was finished on the cross. God's grace is amazing. It's amazing. And it's not a situation where God does 95% of, of the work and we do 5%. No. Or God does 98% and we do 2%. No, no. God did 100% and yeah. we do nothing. Yes. We do nothing. We receive the free gift that he wants to give us. Amen. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 11.6. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were... Grace would no longer be grace. Listen to what Paul also says in Romans 3.24. We are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Let's talk about faith for a moment. Faith is a belief or a trust or a loyalty to a person or a thing. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. It's believing in and having full confidence in what we can't see. That's faith. There are two components to saving faith. There's an intellectual assent or an intellectual agreement or belief and there is trust. Two components. Let me give you an example. We recognize this chair as a chair. That's a chair. We know this is a chair. We recognize it as such, and we know it's designed to hold us up. We have an intellectual assent or an intellectual belief that's a chair. But we display our trust and our reliance on the chair when we sit in the chair. Amen. When we sit in the chair, believing, just having an intellectual agreement that Jesus is Lord, yeah. who died and rose again, just having a belief or an intellectual agreement and knowing who he is, is not enough. The Bible says 
even the demons believe that Amen. and they shudder. Amen. We must put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to sit in his chair of salvation. To sit in the chair, the only chair that can hold us up and carry us through this life in alignment and in God's will. Filled by the Holy Spirit. Faith is believing in and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Without faith, we cannot please God. Think about that. That's in Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, you and I can't please God. So we could do good deeds our whole lives. And if we don't have faith in what he's done, we can't even please him. Not at all. Faith comes from relying upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And understand this, even our faith is not a work. It's a gift. Amen. It's a gift. We're here on Sundays to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Because God blessed us with a revelation of who he is. He blessed us. He opened our spiritual eyes. He lifted the veil. He took all those hard times that you and I have been through. And he turned them into good. And in many cases, he used the hardest times that we've ever gone through. Those nights where we cried out. He used them to draw us to him, to, to lift that veil so we could see our faith is a gift that he blessed us with. It's not a righteous work. Faith is an empty hand receiving God's righteousness. It's us with our hands empty, with nothing to offer, but ourselves, take me, receiving his righteousness. Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Let's talk a moment about Christ alone. Christ alone. We know that Jesus is our sole source of sufficiency. He is all we need. He know, we know that he is our rock. He is our redeemer. He is our strength. He is our wisdom. He's the good shepherd, the high priest. He is Lord of lords and king of kings. Let me read some verses to you. In the book of Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have eternal life. Jesus himself in John 14.6 I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one gets to the Father but through me. John 1, 12. But to all who did receive him, who believes in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Amen. We are children of God through faith in Jesus. That makes you and I brothers and sisters. We don't have to speak the same language. The color of our skin doesn't have to be the same. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are part of the same, same family. What an amazing, loving God we serve. Yes. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Yes. You and I were created in him and through him, for him. The Bible teaches he is the creator of all things. We were created, all things were created in him and through him and for him. Christ alone. Christ himself said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. 
grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Now, let me ask you, because some people get confused by this. In the book of James, does James contradict Paul? Because James says in the second chapter and the 17th verse, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And he also says in the 24th verse of the same chapter, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Wait a minute, didn't we just say that there are so many verses talking about his faith alone, not works? Is James contradicting Paul? There are no inconsistencies in God's perfect word. There are no contradictions in God's perfect word. The scripture is to be rightly divided and, consi and considered in context with itself. James is not saying something different than Paul. James is emphasizing the point that our genuine faith in Christ will produce good works. That our works are evidence of our saving faith. They're proof that we have saving faith. James is refuting, he is, he is contradicting the belief that a person can have faith without producing good works. He is saying, you'll know them by their fruit. If there are no works, they didn't have the saving faith. Amen. There's nothing different in what he's saying than what Paul says. Our good deeds, our good works come from Christ in us. They are a natural product or a natural outgrowth of the Holy Spirit indwelling you and I. Faith brings us salvation. Our active obedience demonstrates that our faith is genuine. The Holy Spirit moves us towards our works and towards our deeds. So, wait a minute. Does this mean, since we know that we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, does this mean that our works and our deeds are unimportant? That they're not significant? That they don't matter? Let me read what Paul says in the 10th verse. We just read Ephesians 8, 9, and 2, 8, 9. Listen to what he says in verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are created by God, we're his handiwork, in Christ for the purpose of doing good works and deeds and bringing glory to God, bringing glory to God with our lives, whether we're at work or at school or with our friends or wherever we are. We are created for the purpose of doing works in the name of Jesus Christ to, to, for him. We're not saved merely, we're not saved for the, uh, to merely sit back and relax and say, ah, what a nice feeling. <laughs> I'm going to heaven. Yahoo! Now let me live my life. No. No, when God saved you and I, we've talked about this. He didn't take us right home. He didn't take the old died on the cross. The new is created. He left us here to be his light and his Amen. truth in this Amen. dark world. He left us here to offer ourselves as living sacrifices for his glory and to point people to him in whatever position or role in life we are. It doesn't matter where you are in life, what your job is or whether you go to school, whatever you do, that's your role or your position. Our identity is the same. We are in Christ created, God's handiwork for good works for him. By the way, we will be rewarded for our works. We will receive rewards for the works we do in this life with the right heart, with pure motive of heart for Christ. We may not see the rewards in this life, yes. but the Bible teaches that we should store up treasures in heaven. We are going to receive spiritual rewards 
that blow away any award we can receive in this life. Amen. If you had a choice right now to be given a check for $10 billion or wait till you get to eternity and see what your heavenly father who spoke the universe into existence has waiting for you, we are far better off waiting for our Lord and not wanting the earthly reward. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with rewards and blessings here. But you and I can't even imagine. We can't even wrap our minds around what God has in store for us when we enter into his kingdom. Amen. We can't even imagine it. We're storing up treasures in heaven. And it's okay to think about that. It's okay to think about that. I know my father sees what I do. I know he knows my heart. I know my father. I